This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 896, recorded on April 29th, 2022. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Fort Lee, New Jersey, Dixon Despommier. Hello there, Amy and Vincent. Um, looking out my window, it looks like a beautiful day. It actually is a beautiful day if you were a bird. Uh, there's a lot of wind out there. Uh, the temperature's in the low 50s. Uh, there's very little humidity, and... Um, we're expecting better weather uh, down the road, but right now it's typical spring. So today the sun is out as, as opposed to yesterday when it oh, wasn't. Oh, by the it way, today is Arbor Day. Diff- just meant to mention a big that. difference. Oh, that's tree day? Yep. So what do we do? Cut down a tree? Mm, the opposite. <laughs> Plant the tree. I'm kidding. Also joining us from New York, Amy Rosenfeld. Hello. How are you? Hello, Amy. I was just uh, up with Amy at Columbia and cleaning out freezers. I threw out thousands of vials. Yes. Right, right, Amy? Yes, we threw out thousands of vials. Five of them were labeled. (laughs) You didn't turn the CO2 on in the incubator? (laughs) He did. He changed. He, he, that was Tuesday's activity. Today we did the liquid nitrogen and we cleaned out an entire freezer. So I'm consolidating. I'm consolidating. It's very satisfying to clean out freezers because there's stuff in there for 20 years at least, right? It's true. Unbelievable. But do you remember cleaning out your freezers, Dixon, or are they still there? Of course I do. I remember how many uh, boxes of slides that I've cut in the section both for EM and for light microscopy. Uh, They just row after row after row after row, and then, then they just disappeared. All that work, nobody wanted them. So Did you I, feel uh, remorse? Did you feel, did you feel remorse? Mm, I felt sadness that I couldn't continue, but uh, my life has been good after that, so I'm okay. I don't feel sad that I'm throwing out vials. As um, long as it doesn't say smallpox on it, that's fine. No, none of them said smallpox. <laughs> One of them said pseudo-rabies virus, which is not a rabies virus. It's a herpes virus of swine, right? Yes. Ah. But, but I don't think it was ours. I think it was left over from Saul. No, uh, actually, Lynn Enquist sent it to me because he said I should work on it. When did he say you should work on it? Oh, many years ago. Actually, I was going to do some kind of experiment, but I never did. But And I don't remember what it was. But those, yeah, he had sent those to me. So, no. Oh. And Amy is not going to work on pseudorabies virus. So. No, I'm not working on pseudorabies virus. Some of the other viruses, that. she said, yeah, keep that, keep that. But that one... She didn't want. Yeah. I kept my Zika collection. Are you going to keep Saul's viruses? I'm going to take some costs, but Cos? that's about it. Yeah. Okay. As a control for some cells that we're going to develop. Because um, David, that's what David Bloom uses as to validate that the cells are correct. Um, but no, I don't. First of all, I'm not even sure he has anything good left since he threw out stuff and then I threw out stuff as I moved into his freezer. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. Uh, let's see. At least three of the five shelves should be solely my stuff. I don't know what he has left, actually. And maybe some of it is, definitely some of it is antibodies that he has left. And apparently nobody wanted them. Well, Dixon um, is given the cross here. Are you? Are you it's enough. Uh, notice Amy says when I take it with me, so <laughs> you listeners can you know in, infer what you think that means. <laughs> <laughs> take it with me. I'm taking it to the grave. It's going to be buried <laughs> with me next to my shoe collection. <laughs> well, that's many years in the future. This is more immediate, but we'll let you. You'll be the one to decide to tell everyone. Okay, we have two papers for you today, and the first one I. I particularly Amy sent it to me and she said, I think Dixon would like this. And so I had to make sure he was here today. And this is a preprint. What is it? Nature? Yeah, nature. Yeah, they're both in nature. Climate change increases cross-species viral transmission risk 
from uh, groups at Georgetown University, the Eco Health Alliance, which, by the way, is just a few blocks from me here at the incubator, Eversource Energy Center, University of Cape Town, and Pacific Lutheran University. The first co-authors are Colin Carlson and Gregory Albury, and the last author is Shwita Bansal. All right, so you, this is all about climate what we should call it is rapid environmental change. It just doesn't just involve temperature. Right. And the, the idea here is to model what might happen on viral transmission, right? Because as the environment changes, the, the idea is that many species geographic ranges are going to shift in the next century or, sh or so. And as animals move elsewhere, they will bring their pathogens and their, their uh, microbiome and virome into new environments and perhaps infect other animals that they've never seen before. And so you get the picture, right? <laughs> and, uh, you know, human, so apparently there's 6,500 different mammal hosts and 21 million possible pairwise combinations of humans with different mammals that could interact. <laughs> And so, um, you know, we will, these animals will share viruses with each other and, and with humans possibly for the first time. So this, they, they make an attempt to model this in this paper. Now, Dixon, what do you think of this idea of modeling the potential risk? Does this make sense? Well, you have to do a lot of things and modeling is just one of them, but, um, um, when you model something, of course, people start to doubt it right away because they uh, this is just a mathematical construct. They yeah, don't yeah. give much weight to non-reality or to uh, meta-analysis. <clears throat> Pardon me, I've got a little cold. I don't. So, um, on the other hand, modeling has really improved the way we look at the spread of malaria in the African countries in particular. And... Um, it's gone a long way to heading off major disasters by being able to predict if the weather shifts or if the climate shifts, what will we do? Should we be uh, giving more prophylaxis rather than treatment? That sort of thing. Should we have more health teams in areas where they're more needed? Uh, it, re it allows you to think about allocating resources to head off epidemics. That's that's what I think all of this means, and it adds up to uh, people are kind of constantly thinking about it. And yes, I, I think it's very, very worthwhile. Absolutely. So they predicted how and where global change could make novel opportunities for animals to share viruses. Right. And particularly those that might have, have risks for human health. And they focused on mammals. They have We have a lot of data on mammals, a lot of diversity, uh, and of course, most relevant, most likely to human health. Uh, and they built what they call species distribution models for 3,870 placental mammal species and projected uh, how they would move, these animals would move around based on four different scenarios for climate change. Okay, so uh, they have different conditions. For example, one is uh, sustainable land use change and a high chance of keeping global warming under two degrees Celsius to another one is high chance of over four degrees Celsius warming, continued fossil fuel reliance, rapid land degradation and change. So they have different four different scenarios. And we've already uh, warmed a degree or so, right? Is that correct? That's right, 1.5. Wow. Um, Wasn't the Paris Accords to keep us under two? <laughs> yes. yes, yes, in fact. Uh, we're doing well with that, I see. Oh, the yeah. Paris Agreement to keep global warming well below two degrees C. I see. We're, <laughs> we're, we're, we're adhering rapidly to that. That's a problem. No, that's, that's the problem. That's the I problem. know that was sarcasm. And so they used the uh, models to, to develop this, and then they used another model to predict the probability of a viral sharing event and uh, tested the hypothesis that some environmental change will alter communities of mammals in ways that expose hosts to new viruses. Okay, so that's the idea. So they have some data, right? They have number of mammals, they, they have they where they, they live, 
They yeah, have they how many viruses we know of, which is probably a vast underestimate. Well, the but, other problem is is that they only focused on mammals, right? Mammal to mammal yeah. transmission. They don't even factor in like the arthropods and the ticks. So it's oh, probably right. even greater, right? <laughs> yes. The high, the idea that you're going to encounter a novel, this novel host host interaction. Don't you think is even actually greater than what they predict? Yeah, for sure. No, I think they have a minimum, a conservative estimate, I would say. Right. Dixon? I don't think that they're just looking at mammals. I think there are lots of interconnected groups and they're they divvied it up and they're all taking their separate parts, but they're gonna come back together with it. They yeah, can't I think eliminate the, them. They can't they can't. It's impossible. I think in the in the discussion maybe they do mention they they've ignored ocean animals right they ignored birds right uh, birds won't <laughs> amphibians right <laughs> yeah i mean if you just look at the spillover from like what we're now talking about the spillover of avian flu h5 that's right yeah. right yeah yeah and sure. you know well you can't do everything the part of the problem is you can't do everything but you can do things which gives you hints that it's a bigger picture than we've paid attention to in the past. Yeah, for sure. So, Dixon, this idea of species range shifts. Yes. Not quite. So, what what happens? It gets if, if if we have climate change, then the environment is not suitable for wherever whatever species is living in a certain place, and they move on. Is that the idea? Well, they seek out their comfort zones. So that's the that's the deal. And, you know, you say, well, what do you do about the trees and the plants? Well, they, they can do that because every year they shed seeds. And the seeds don't germinate <clears throat> uniformly. They germinate in places which have the ideal conditions for germination. And that's how far it's moved from one place to another. They can take 10 years and go 100 miles. That's that's remarkable because they're not they don't have many legs to stand on, right? So, but isn't that what we? Isn't that what you used to tell me about the wind? Like about wind, when we were talking about different, that's right. That's right. different animals or different or different kinds of trees and seeing this is true. Well, that, in the tropics, the animals uh, they uh, they pollinate the trees. So you've got bats and um, insects of various kinds, hummingbirds. In fact, you've got one animal species per tree species and if the animal disappears the tree disappears that's how intimately locked they are <clears throat> it's different in the in the temperate zones the wind distributes the pollen as we know every spring and every fall and uh, <clears throat> the trees get their pollination from the wind so the wind then takes those leaves and most of the leaves most of the um, the seed types for temperate zone plants have some wind capturing capacity to them, like dandelions and little propellers for maple seeds and that sort of thing. Whereas the um, tropicals have these large fruits that fall on the ground. And then the animal feces that itself, after it's eaten, distributes the seeds to various parts of the forest to replenish the trees. So quite different, quite different. So a lot of these models have to take into account tropical rather than temperate zone forests. And we know less about them, even though we've studied them more than we do about temperate zone forests because the number of species of trees is astounding. Uh, there are something like, I'm trying to remember the number. I, I've, I've, it's over 500,000 different tree species, and most of them are tropical. So though, when those trees start to move around or they start to disappear, large groups of animals that are dependent upon their fruits and their flowers and their bark and their, all of that, all that shifts. And, you know, fruit bats, they've got wings and they can go from one place to the next. So yeah. When, yeah. when the trees are in bloom someplace, they all congregate to that place. <laughs> you've got so happened in Malaysia. That's in the nineties in Malaysia, we, we exactly. burned forests exactly. and the, the bats, the fruit bats left and they ended up in the pig farms where they found yeah, mangoes. Exactly. Trees. The mango grows, right? The, yeah, which they That's planted right. in the piggeries, outdoor piggeries. It's so, exactly Dixon, right. when an animal is un, is no longer comfortable, it just randomly moves until it finds no something. Random, it no, there's no random about it. Uh, they follow their temperate zone tolerances, uh -huh. and it's based on humidity and temperature and altitude. Those three things, that determines where everything lives, just those three things. 
but they're going to just start walking. Well, they'll, they'll they'll walk towards a gradient that favors their survival. Yeah, okay. I, I have problems. If you ask an elephant where the nearest water source is, and if you speak elephant, <laughs> and you ask politely, they'll show it to you. Because so they, they know. know where it is. It's hundreds of years of history okay. <clears throat> that they've been tapping into this scarcity. And so I think that uh, animals... You don't accuse them of being smarter. They just have more history with the environment. And yeah. their whole lives are dependent on knowing the environment. Would you say they have more respect for the environment than humans? No, their whole lives depend on it. I mean, when you say respect, okay. that's kind of a human characteristic, I think. But, well, we trash the environment, right? Yeah, but elephants do too, though. Okay, elephants, animals do. You're they right. They can come into a, a savanna and they can strip all the bark off the trees and those trees yeah. die and then there are fires and then okay. all kinds of bad things. So they're not, they're not right, actually. So, um, so it's more that they move towards their comfort zone versus yes. a food source. They move or towards the, the place food. where they can survive the best. That drives everything, and that's food yeah, and water. Includes food and lack yeah. of predation. All right, let's go back to their model. So first of all, they say if species range shifts keep pace with climate change. They predict the vast majority of mammals will overlap with at least one unfamiliar species somewhere in the future, wherever they go, no uh -huh. matter what, which of these emissions scenarios they use. This would permit over 300,000 first encounters in all four of their climate scenarios, which is about a doubling of species contact compared to today. Doubling. And these first encounters, they call them, <laughs> will occur everywhere in the world, but concentrated in tropical Africa and Southeast Asia. That's right. And they said this was this was not what we expected because we thought species would aggregate at higher latitudes. Um, but uh, they said we find when species shift along latitudinal gradients, they travel in the same direction as others that are already included in their assemblage, leading to few first encounters. In contrast, when they track thermal optima, as Dixon was just saying, uh, they will aggregate in the most novel combinations. Exactly. Very interesting. Very interesting. So anyway, that's doubling of encounters, right? Right. So yeah. this global reorganization of mammals that will impact the structure of the mammalian viral. So right. then they then they go on to model that. They figure there's going to be a minimum of 15,000 cross-species transmission events of at least one novel virus between every pair of new encounters, right? And this, most of the sharing is going to happen in high elevation, species-rich ecosystems in Africa and Asia. So these... Animals are going to swap their viruses, and um, that eventually might lead on to people, right? Right. And then they looked at dispersion, right? How far could an animal go? Because some animals are flightless, <laughs> and some can fly around. Um, so dispersal limits, if you don't have wings, that, that limits the, uh, the novel encounters, right, that you can have. Um, and also trophic position and body size. Dixon, what's trophic position? For right. An animal? So in, in nature, you've got just four zones, basically. You've got um, trophic zone number one, which is the primary producers. Those are plants. They plants, take sunlight okay. and convert it to the more plant material. Then we've got primary consumers. That's trophic level number two. Animals that only eat plants. Now, there are very few that actually only do that. Even though you think, like, say, for instance, the hippopotamus uh, is a strict herbivore, there are filmed encounters of hippopotami with antelope trespassing on their land. And when they kill one, every hippopotamus comes over and takes a bite. So no one would have guessed that unless some tourist actually filmed that encounter, right? It took Jane mm. Goodall a long time to find out that chimpanzees love meat, <clears throat> especially their own species. So lots of animal mm. eating things that okay so the second one is the strict herbivore if you want to consider that the third one is the animals that eat animals that eat plants <clears throat> so those are the those are the um uh, the predator species <clears throat> they only eat meat 
Um, they mm. eat <clears throat> animals that are abundant. So, you know, it's an abundance thing. So the top of this food chain is pyramid. The fourth trophic level is sort of a mix of animals that both switch between herbivory and carnivorous behavior. And so you, it's complicated when you start looking at the veldt of East Africa and you start to try to characterize those animals mm, and yeah, yeah. you're not sure if which is which. And then all of a sudden the change, the, the weather changes or the patterns change and they scatter in different directions according to their okay. own preferences. Okay. Anyway, so these trophic position and body size determine dispersal capacity. And as a consequence, carnivores account for slightly more first encounters while ungulates and rodents have fewer because I guess they have a different trophic position and body size, right? Well, they they don't stay in herds. Yeah. And again, most of these cross-species viral transmissions are going to happen in Southeast Asia. And bats seem to disproportionately drive dispersal. Yes. As you might guess, right? They can move around. And they even say there's something called non-migratory bats. They can still travel hundreds of kilometers in a lifetime. So I guess there are migratory bats that go long distances, right? But they're also determining where the trees grow because the seeds that they're eating of the fruit must pass through their gut tract in order to germinate. It's an essential. Yeah. So basically they conclude that bats are probably going to be a major driver of uh, cross-species transmission and they're going to bring uh, new viruses into into different regions. Absolutely. Um, Never heard of such a thing. Yeah, I know. They didn't need to do a model to do that, did they? <laughs> well, what they, you know, the bat went to the lab and the, then there was this leak, you know. <laughs> All right. So now what about human health? Uh, what's the implication for human health? Of course, they say, this, so basically here's the concept, and I think it makes sense. If a virus can jump from one mammal to another because it's a new encounter and these mammals have never encountered each other before, then it probably can make a jump to humans. That might for, foresee uh, making a successful jump to humans. Um, and they say there are 10,000 potentially zoonotic viruses currently circulating in mammal hosts. I don't know where they got that, that number. It seems like an underestimate, doesn't it, Amy? Yeah, I think so. 10,000? Uh, to me, it sounds very low, but what do I know? So they did a specific modeling with uh, Zaire Ebola virus, which has... 13 possible hosts in Africa, and they projected possible first encounters involving these 13 different species. And so, again, in the future, when these animals are migrating, they projected these 13 species could encounter 3,695 new mammals in one of their climate scenarios. Um, and maybe dispersal limitations, you know, trophic level body size would reduce it to 2,600, which would give you almost 100 new viral sharing events. So basically, and that's without humans, just this mixing could expose new wildlife species to uh, Ebola virus. And they say this is not unique to Ebola. There are um, many other potential uh, interactions between bats and primates. And they say just bats and primates alone could lead to 110 new viral sharing events. Of course, if you have high population, human density, this makes it even worse, right? Because right, right. uh, these first encounters are going to happen in places that are either settled by humans. Yep. Uh, or they say use this cropland. And they say it's not less likely to occur in forests, despite the literature, which suggests that forests harbor most undiscovered viruses. Uh, because people tend to uh, aggregate, uh, not in forests, right? <laughs> <laughs> they don't That's aggregate true. in forests. That is true. But many new, many zoonotic viruses come uh, from farming of activities and uh, it, it, where, where humans are congregating, of course. Um, they say, Dixon, they say something that I found interesting. The tendency of human settlements to aggregate on continental edges and around biodiversity hotspots. Uh, yep. Why continental edges? It's the water. Gives you an, um, sure. It gives you the shipping lanes, right? Okay. Able to move by sea. Um, you know, estuaries, particularly estuaries, that is an, a major zone for encroachment because that's where all the uh, reproduction of the ocean okay. life occurs. Got it. 
even the freshwater, like the salmon, come up into the freshwater to spawn. Absolutely. And Andromus, is that in Andromus, Dixon? It is, it is. I learned something by listening to you all these years. Uh-huh. And I listening to you. I hope. They say, we predict that tropical hotspots of novel viral sharing will uh, be in areas of high population density in 2070. Not too many years from now. I won't be here. Dixon won't. Maybe Amy will be here. Maybe. You probably will. Yeah, hopefully not. Let me know what happens, okay? Okay, I'll call you. Right ahead. I'll call you. I'll call you. (laughs) Okay. I'll text you. How's that? Maybe, maybe oh, when, Dixon, when Dixon and I are gone, you're going to miss us? Of course. <laughs> Don't go there. Well, it's funny. Anyway, 2070, especially. But I'm going to text you, so it'll be fine. Especially in the Ethiopian right. Highlands, the Rift Valley, India, Eastern China, Indonesia, and Philippines. They think that's the big hotspots of tropical viral sharing. So these hotspots have other names also, and one of them is ecotones. So just briefly mentioned, when one ecosystem type meets another, the transition zone between both of those is called an ecotone. And the animals from both ecosystems attempt to extend their own ecosystem into the others. It's a zone of conflict. And those conflicts create spread of infectious diseases, uh, particularly parasitic infectious diseases that depend upon, uh, <clears throat> pardon me, um, vector. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, and and the, the, vector, the vector spread of these diseases at these zones is extremely exaggerated in many areas. And mm-hmm. the, the areas that you just mentioned are those areas. Ah, I see. But next they said, what if we uh, mitigate? What if we can... Slow down climate change. Slow it down? There's no such thing as climate change. What am I slowing down? (laughs) Well, they say it can't, it cannot stop viral, climate driven viral sharing. Even the mildest scenarios for warming appear likely to produce at least as much or even more cross species transmission because they say when warming is slower, species can more successfully track climate optima. So they're Uh easy to move. So, Dixon, that's what you were saying. They yep. seek their comfort zone, and if the climate changes more slowly, it's easier for them to do that. That's right. It's interesting, isn't it? Very interesting. I didn't know that. So the, even the mildest perturbation of the climate can make thousands of uh, new opportunities. They right, actually they actually talk about SARS-CoV-2, and they say, well, we're not saying that SARS-CoV-2 is a consequence of, of climate change, but it certainly is an example, example of what might happen in one of these scenarios, right? Well, they use Yasutu also as like some, you know, as an um, uh, example of yeah. like this eco con- ecozone conflict, right? What is Yasutu? Tell us, Amy. It's an ar- it's a arbovirus that's, that is uh, related to Zika. Yeah. Mosquito driven? Yeah. And it, there's been several outbreaks of it uh, in Europe, in Italy. Mm-hmm. And when we were doing our Zika work, we were interested in whether or not it could cause microcephaly because I believe it causes microcephaly in like sheep. Huh. Or was that Wells, Wells, Wells Brussels virus? Wessels Braun. Wessels Braun. Oh, gosh, Amy, you're bringing me back to the old days. Yeah, five <laughs> years ago. Ancient I know. history. I know. We've learned so much since then. But yeah, remember that? And we have some use too and stuff. And I think it kills the black crows now. I think it's a black crow disease. Songbirds? Maybe songbirds. What am I thinking of? Flu. Avian flu. No, no, no. It was something else where the birds were quiet. I don't know. Okay, anyway, they say- but it's, yeah, so we we were interested in Wessel Braun and Yusutu and stuff. And yeah. It, it's, yeah, it's starting to migrate through like the more temperate climates of India, of Italy and stuff in Europe. So they say, okay, even though, the, the, even if we do a lot of work, it's still going to happen. Doesn't mean you shouldn't do anything, right? Say we caution these results should not be interpreted as a justification for inaction because you can imagine that certain individuals would say, "Oh, look, there's nothing we can do to stop this. 
So let's not do anything. Because they do say the change is going to be accompanied by mass deformation, devastating disease emergence, and unprecedented levels of human displacement and global instability, which we're already seeing global instability, right? Sure. Personally, I think the hot weather makes people crazy. Coming well, from the man who likes hot and humid. If you go to India right now, you'll find a lot of people that are quite preserved. Quite well, preserved. just let me give you an example. I mean, there's a country right now where it's usually cold and they're behaving erratically. Their leader is behaving erratically because maybe because it's a little warmer. I don't know. I know. that's. We launched just it in the middle of the winter. I know, but the effects were from the summer. Oh, Okay. The All right, what about, what about timing? What about timing? Let's wrap this up on timing. Um, when's this going to happen? So they think it's going to start later in the 21st century. No, no, no. It's already happening. I was going to say, and that's the part I didn't agree with in this paper, is I think it negates the fact that it's already occurred. Of course. Yeah, I agree. It's already it's occurred. It's not going to just yeah. start all of a sudden. Well, no. you know. It's a gradual process that you don't even notice until it's too late. Yeah, well, that's actually, what my philosophy was. Look, they model three time intervals, 2011 to 2040, 2041 to 70, and 71 to 2100. And they basically say the majority of first encounters are happening 2011 to 2040. So you're right, they're already happening. And their model sure, says course, that as course, well. Of course, of course. And they keep, they keep accumulating, and they say they, first encounters continue to non-trivially accumulate over time. Yep. Really? Um, this wasn't a trivial event, the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic? <laughs> was it a trivial event? Non-trivially. No, it's not a trivial event. Of course not. And so put, to put more succinctly, they say, species continue to meet throughout the century. And our simulations indicate that how fast species move will matter more to the timing and magnitude of first encounters than how fast suitable habitat moves or her has already moved. Well, if it's all about species movement, then I don't think that they factored in the fact that humans fly so much. We move no, way I don't think faster they did. that way faster than we used to. Yeah, Dixon? for sure. What? You think that fly uh, human travel? Uh, oh yeah, an airplane it enhances, is one of the best vectors yeah, of enhances diseases it. you can imagine. Yeah, enhances well, several it. Several airlines have already figured out how to take care of that. You know, like Qantas and a few others. They spray the plane before you get in. They spray it before you get out. Really? So, yeah. Yeah, they do. They say, uh, our findings suggest that in a world that has already passed plus one degree C of global warming, the majority of climate-related opportunities for novel viral sharing may already have been realized. That's right. Um, yep. So the horses and, have already uh, left the barn. You want to close the door, go for it, but there's nothing left yeah. inside. Climate change is already reshaping the mammalian environment, and as warming continues, we predict that both the opportunities created for an ecological novelty and resulting impacts on viral assemblages will begin to saturate ah, in the next 50 years. Saturate, really, the right word? I don't think that's correct, right? But Yeah, I'm not sure that you can... I mean, with viral, but just even with recombination events in crop, I don't think yeah, you can yeah. hit, ever hit saturation. Dixon? Is that anybody's guess? I mean, hardly anybody's looking, so how would you know? That's a what good you point. What really is a better surveillance mechanism that's um, generated by AI. Well, they, and, they, you know, in the discussion, Dixon, they call for more surveillance. That's right. And they say in the next decade alone, it could cost at least a billion dollars to identify yeah. and counteract zoonotic threats before they spread. And That's they say nothing. this is an unexpected challenge for virological research. Yep. The next thing you know, it's, they'll be uh, teaching ecology and virology courses. Well, they, we need more virologists <laughs> to do this work. It's true. Um, they also say we only looked at mammals, but birds have a big virome, amphibians, marine mammals. And they sure. cited a recent study implicating reduced Arctic sea ice right. leading to novel viral transmission between pinnipeds and sea otters. Right. I have to read that paper. Amy, we may do that on TWIV. It's, yeah. Excuse me. Oh, it sounds oh, really cool, doesn't it? Yeah. It does. I don't know what a pinniped is, though. It's a seal. Oh, it's a seal. Yep. 
It wasn't, nice. though, it wasn't, it wouldn't It's have different been than a, a pinhead. Well, that's what I was wondering, if it really was a difference than a pinhead or no, not. Pinheads, <laughs> pinheads include all the seals. Yeah. I was thinking it was just a pinhead. Our findings suggest that climate change could easily become the dominant anthropogenic force in viral cross-species transmission, which will undoubtedly have a downstream impact on human health and pandemic risk. So they say we have to not only look at spillover into people, but also among wildlife species. I don't think we do much of that at all, do we, Amy? No. Um, don't we have a national virology lab out in Iowa that does some of that? Oh, they don't do any of that. Well, very little, I think. I think the only ones that they keep track of is like flu for the economic destruction of the... Well, they're, of they're tracking the cervid... Um, uh, <clears throat> You know, Jakob Krosfeld, like like syndrome in servants. Oh, the and, chronic and wasting cow. disease. Yeah. <clears throat> chronic is what I meant to say. Yes, that's right. Yeah, but I don't know that that's transmittable um, in the same fashion. Doesn't no, it, I, it was not clear to me. They have a wide range. They were the ones that discovered the West Nile virus in back in 1999 and arrived on our shores. So they... They didn't get much credit for it in the beginning, but it turned out to be the case. Dixon, do you have some water there you can drink? You make me. I wish. You want me to get well, you a glass I'm, of water? Uh, I'm sitting. Well, no time for that. Go ahead. You guys continue on. I'm sure I can last until the end of the show. Okay. <laughs> I've got a mini drought going on here in Fort Lee. <laughs> <laughs> My animals are dispersing. Anyway, so seek that I, thought, water. I thought that was quite a provocative. Uh, even though, as, as Dixon says, it's modeling and you never know, but I think the implications are clear. They have a lot of examples now where they can trace backwards and they know what the situation was. Yeah. And some of the models are quite good at predicting what actually happened afterwards. Oh, you mean if you know what happened, the models yes. are good at predicting. <laughs> yeah, you model the past and then you base that on your future. Oh, I see, I see. You base your future on that past. Got exactly okay. right. And, and that, that works. That okay. actually works. Okay. All right, now we have a paper on SARS-CoV-2, which is really uh, one of these spillover thingies, right? <laughs> spillover thingies? Is that a scientific word? No, I'm spillover sorry. I'm thingies? just trying to be lighthearted and uh, spillover <laughs> events. It's Friday. Uh, but I'm not sure that, you know, we can pinpoint any any anthropogenic. Well, I guess the anthropogenic activity is uh, harvesting animals, right? That's anthropogenic. So, but that's well. Happened. I don't know if it's harvesting animals or just uh, exposure in a lifestyle that we just don't participate in. Well, a lot of people also, yeah. I think yeah, you I'm know density, sure that, population density, which which uh, enables spread of infections, right? Yeah, I'm not sure that we have to say harvesting animals. You're just exposed to the animals, right? Because yeah, we've always harvested animals, right? Yeah. Yep. Exactly. And like we don't, you know, you don't harvest an animal to be exposed to NEPA, right? Right. No, and you, you don't you harvest can. an animal, I guess it's harvested, but I don't know that you, it would be considered harvested if it were like MERS from your camel. Well, well, I think harvesting animals has two parts. One is to eat them and the other one is to show them off to your friends as to how big a rack of a deer you just shot. And then Lord knows what happens to it after that. So, so the, the NEPA, waste. Amy, was because we had pig farms with, with orchards in them, right? right. Yes, but that's different. That's Related different. Yeah, to Yeah, that's farm. what I'm saying. It's different. That's different. But we have huge piggeries where, because we need we to do. provide protein for a lot of people, population growth, you know, and, this is true. and then deforesting to make more cropland. So you slash and keep burn. Going, keep going, keep and going. And you push the right. bats out of their habitat. Right. Yep. So, but you're not really harvesting the bats, right? You've invaded no, no, no. their space. We've invaded their space. Uh, but you know what really frustrates me, and I, I meant to mention this during the previous paper. You know, there are obviously many people who are concerned about this, but the world leaders seem to be not concerned. Depending right. on what political persuasion you are of, you know, if you favor business, then you say no, leave it alone. We're not going to regulate anything because we mostly love business. The energy industries. <laughs> I mean, it's just very frustrating. And in the end, who who suffers? The next Everybody. generation, right? Everybody. Well, right. I mean, 
Yeah, but it's not always the next generation, right? No, well, it's everybody it's right us. away. It's us. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think what's the next happening generation right now in Ukraine that? has great ramifications for the next 10 to 15 years with regards to renewable energy sources because they're going to realize that you're being held prisoner by one country that controls the fossil fuel flow. Whereas if you had control of your renewables, it doesn't really matter what they do. Well, yeah. isn't that what and they it's already switch fast? Right. Isn't that what they already recognized? Is that what? Didn't they partial? They've recognized it, but like, like oh, Russianized, cut off. Russianized. 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 Yeah, Uh-oh. maybe not. Well, it was a planned strategy to, to control energy. Of course, of course. But right. That kind of that's not going to last forever. No, it isn't. No, it's not. No. And but, that could really, you know, you look at this war as a turning point with regards to climate change yeah. and for the better, not for the worse. Yeah. But I was just thinking about like, you know, it's not even the next generation. I mean, we screwed up the climate and then, you know, you had Zika, right? With all those children who have microcephaly who are going to be, yep. Yep. who are yep. damaged from even before they're born to their, I don't know however long they're going to live, 70, 80 years, whatever, right? Yeah. Anyway, the next paper is a Nature article. Increased memory B cell potency in breath after a SARS-CoV-2 mRNA boost. So this is addresses a question we've talked about a lot on TWIV. You know, what what's the effect of the first booster? We're not getting to the second one today. Just first. <laughs> you get two doses of mRNA vaccine and then a boost. What happens? And we've talked a lot about what happens to the antibody uh, strength and breath. And here they also look at that, but also uh, in terms of memory uh, B cells. So this is from a group at uh, Rockefeller University, uh, Theodora Hatsuanu, Paul Binash, Michel Nussenzweig, who's the son of someone Dixon knows very well. Yep. Ruth <laughs> and, and Victor Nussenzweig. Ruth and Victor. And the first author is Frauke Mückisch. Mückisch. Mooks. I don't know how many co-first authors there are, um, but the th- the third, fourth author is Christian Gebler, who was on Immune some time ago. So um, this is a pre-reviewed, but a pre- a what do you call this? A accelerated, accelerated article part. preview, yeah. right? It was so important that they couldn't format it properly. Yeah, it's really a mess. Um, <laughs> I don't get it. All right, so what they have here is a cohort of 42 volunteers with no prior history of infection by SARS-CoV-2. And these were recruited in 2021, and they give uh, blood. And they they got either Moderna or Pfizer BioNTech mRNA vaccines. They're 23 to 78 years old, 48% male, 52% female. And they get samples in, in the following time points, two and a half weeks after the prime, so two mRNA doses, then a prime, 1.3 and five months after the second vaccine dose, and one month after the third dose. So the prime is the first, of course, the second, and then the booster, the third dose. Two and a half weeks after the first, 1.3, five months after the second, one month after the third so they have these bloods from them, and they look f- at the antibodies. First, they look at binding of antibodies by ELISA, which I see Amy doing all the time these days. Yes, I'm doing She's a lot in the hood with 96 well plates stacked up, and she's got a multi-well multi-tunnel pipetter. Pipetter, yes. I'm giving she's- myself metacarpal tunnel syndrome. Metacarpal tunnel? Yeah, where you pipette too much. Oh. All right, so what they find, they're looking at IgM, IgG, and IgA to the receptor binding domain of the spike protein of the Wuhan isolate, ancestral SARS-CoV-2. So five months, during the five months after the second vaccine dose, you see antibody reactivity declining. And then you get the the third dose and they go back up again. Nothing shocking here, right, Amy? Yeah, and then it's not even the right comparison. Well, tell us about that. So, like, the right comparison should have been at the same time point after the second dose. 
Yeah. Because your argument is is that the third dose may is so much better than just having two doses. So what is what was elicited one one month or whatever time frame this is after the second dose? Because you when you so you go down, right? And then you go, you down. go up. But is the slope of the line really different? Well, I presume if you waited five months after the third, third dose, dose, you'd be at the same fifty percent decrease. So probably, then you've done probably. nothing. Then it's mute. Well, I agree. I agree with that. I mean, th that's not the key of the paper, though. I mean, the key is the memory B cell characterization. But yes, you're right. Right, but I could have gotten. The, uh, it's not clear that you don't get exactly. You don't get a memory B cell response after whatever time after the second. Well, all they're seeing here is that you, when you get a boost. You boost the antibody titers, right? Right, right. That's why I say and, this. And they say, but they say it's like more, it's a significant increase following the third dose. Well, what was the increase when you did the second dose? So it's really probably nothing This nothing different. I would agree, yeah. Uh, but they also, because you used a time frame that was so far out, it makes yeah. it appear like there's a difference when there really wasn't a difference. No, I think this is just what you would expect, right, for this kind of protocol. Right, but I would never, if I came to you and I said, oh, look, we got a big increase in antibodies, your first question would have been to me, so what was it two months after you did the first boost, right? Uh, the second dose, you mean? Yeah, the second dose. You would have said to me, it's probably, you're probably back at baseline. Yeah, I would agree. And I haven't changed anything. No, I don't think this, this is just making sure that the Sierra have the expected uh, titers. I know, but it's been a big deal in like the literature and it's kind of like a big deal. They are all applying it as like a big deal. You mean the effect of the boost? Yeah. No, it's not a big oh, deal. Oh, antibodies it's went up, but antibody, I They're guarantee that to. slope of the, right, and I guarantee you that slope of the line is the same after any vaccine. Any boost. Yeah. All right, so then they looked at neutralizing activity. They have a pseudotyped, so they have HIV with a spike of uh, SARS-CoV-2. So between 1.3 and 5 months after the second dose, the Neutralizing titers decrease 7.3 fold. And what do you think happens, Amy, when you get the third vaccine dose? Well, it goes up. It goes up. Right, but I want to know if you came back 1.3 months after the third dose, did it decrease the 7.3 fold? Most likely. Uh, they have one month after the third dose here, right? That's the time point that they're measuring, one month after the third dose. So at that point, you still see 11.9-fold increase compared to previous, the previous time point, after the five months after the second dose. No, but five months isn't the right time point to compare. That's my okay. point. Yeah. yeah. And they really also the find that this third dose increases night neutralization against beta, delta, and Omicron BA1, which has been published before and we've talked about. They, they make this interesting statement. The correlates of protective neutralizing titers against Omicron are not defined. Nevertheless, <laughs> reduced activity in, a, in third dose vaccine recipients is likely to explain why vaccinees remain particularly susceptible to infection by this variant. Not a variant. Yeah, it's a what? variant. Yes. Yeah, what? So it's uh, the... I don't understand because the third dose boosts neutralization titers... 37-fold for BA1. Right, that's why I said what? And they say the reduced activity against BA1 in third-dose vaccine recipients is likely to explain why they get infected. I don't... That, that, that's not... That that's, shoots themselves in the foot. Well, that's not what their data said, right? This was a 37-fold increase, so I'm not sure. Well, it's not even what the... Not what their data said, and it's not the narrative that we're we're perpetuating. We're perpetuating Maybe. the narrative of you needed a third dose in order to have high enough neutralizing antibody titers against Omicron. Yeah, I think it's a typo. Maybe they mean second vac dose vaccine recipients. I don't know what they mean. I don't. I don't. I don't that doesn't to. make sense. But I highlighted it because I wanted to to point out that it's kind of confusing. Well, it's not kind of confusing. It's it undercuts their their. Yeah their argument, right? It undercuts the argument that you need a third dose. Yeah, yeah, I agree. 
All right, so now they look at memory B cells. So normally memory B cells don't make antibody, but when they encounter antigen. Again, they use the word breakthrough infection. I know. I why don't does like she them. do that? I don't know why they're using, because everyone uses breakthrough. I know, but she's supposed to be above that. She doesn't oh. often have control of the, uh, of the, she's of a, the writing. She's a, she's a co-corresponding author, and that's not an excuse. Anyway, so when you get infected, then the memory B cells uh, encounter the antigen, and they begin to expand, and they make antibody-secreting plasma cells, which make the antibody. And then they make more memory cells and they make germinal center B cells where those, those then undergo affinity maturation. So uh, they wanted to look at the effects of the third vaccine dose on this mem B cell memory compartment. So you can measure memory B cells uh, by looking at surface markers on the cells by flow cytometry, okay? And so you can you can use the uh, the receptor binding domain as a stain, and then you can look for other markers of memory cells, memory B cells. So what they find is when you get a third vaccine dose, you see increased number of memory B cells that can bind the RBD of SARS-CoV-2, more so than you saw after the second dose. Shocking. And then they also quote papers which say it's even higher than you see in naturally infected individuals. Okay, so you, you, third dose, you get a lot of memory B cells um, proliferating. Uh, so then they cloned out the paired antibody sequences uh, from these B cells, which is something that Amy is going to do, right? Yes. So basically you take I don't know how they did it. I don't remember, but you can take... They did not do it the way we're doing it. They made hybridomas. They made hybridomas? Okay. And then from the hybridomas, which secrete a single antibody, you can clone out the genes. So they p obtained 1,370 paired antibody sequences. Paired means heavy and light chains, right? So you can create the whole antibody molecule from five individuals who were sampled five months after the second dose and one month after the third vaccine dose. So I have a problem with the five months after the second dose. Go ahead. Go ahead. What is it? So you've already started to contract your antibody response, right? Yes. So things that may be one or two or five most likely are lost. Yeah, they're below the level of detection. Right. right. Yeah. So if you had gone at the same time point, it would have been a better comparison. What would you do uh, one month after? One month after the second and one month after the third, right? Yeah, I, th I agree. Because otherwise you've already start you you're not accounting for the contraction of the response having begun, right? Yeah. And so yeah. if everything contracts at the same rate, the things that were, you know, you only had one or two copies of are going to be lost, right? Yeah. Right. But m they probably would have still been present at one month after the second All vaccine. Right. So let's keep that in mind as we go through the data to see if we can use that to explain it. Um I just thought that I just realized that paired antibody it probably means they're paired with respect to five months after the second and one month after the third dose. It's not paired heavy and light chain, right? No, it's not paired heavy and light chain. Right. They generally, unless you do what we're going to do, you generally just do the variable region. Okay. Thank you. All right. So after the third vaccine dose, they see expanded clones of memory B cells, which could either be s s persisting clones that were there before um, or unique clones that are expanded after the third dose, right? Or they could have just been the clones that were kind of crappy after the second dose that really, you know, came along too yes. late. You made four, four things and you contracted beneath the level of detection, right? Yeah, so this right. idea that they're unique may not be correct. 
As I say, clones found uniquely after the third dose could represent entirely new lineages elicited by the boost or rare memory cells. And you're saying most likely rare because of the timing, right? Yeah. Okay. I don't think they can distinguish between it, but although your, right. your timing experiment would do it, would allow you to do that, right? Yeah. yeah, my experiments allow me to do it, but, you know, I thought this fully through. Yeah, so I think the key, what they're hoping is that these unique memory B cells that they find after the third dose are new lineages, although they can't distinguish that. You can't from, prove it. Can't prove it, yeah. Dixon? He muted himself. Well, that's because I had to cough. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> I saved Vincent at least 10 seconds of editing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, then that's forgivable because I'll that will save me 10 minutes of listening to him complain. Well, you're, really? a, you're, you're at a zone in discussion that I'm more learning than contributing to. So I'm interested in what you have to say. Okay, so now let's continue the analysis of these antibodies these expanded clones of memory cells accounted for 33 percent of the repertoire five months after the second dose and and 47 percent one month after the third dose okay is that really statistically significant it's kind of close yeah but they don't have a lot of numbers right they only have five from one from five people you needed yeah. to do more than five people the, uh, and they say the increase in clonality, the 33 to 47%, was due to a 3.1-fold three expansion of persisting RBD-specific memory B cells. And they say this is what is in support of this. They accumulated only two additional somatic mutations, so a modest number of additional cell divisions which is characteristic of a germinal center independent process. So B cells can mature in the germinal center of lymph node. They can undergo affinity maturation where they accumulate mutations in the genes, the antibody genes, and increase affinity, for example. Or they can do it in a germinal center independent process, which is characterized by fewer uh, somatic mutations. That's what they see here. Um so uh, there was also a 1.7-fold increase in the number of newly emerging unique clones of memory cells after the third dose um, compared to five months. Although you would say, Amy, they were probably there and you just... Yeah, I think that they them. were probably yeah. there. And then they count, and then they shoot themselves in the foot again because they say it doesn't reach statistics significant. So basically there was no change. But they do say these cells are more mutated than the unique clones that were present five months after the second vaccine dose. Sure. And so in both cases, so more mutated, the numbers of mutations were greater at five months after the second dose, indicating persisting evolution in cell division. So they conclude that the third vaccine dose leads to expansion and evolution of the memory B cell compartment. Sure. I guess you don't buy it because you think that the timing is screwing everything up, right? Yeah, I think that their sample their sampling is is not their time frame the the comparison is not correct. Yeah, because you've contracted and so you've lost things. And so I'm not convinced that comparing apples to bananas can say anything. So you don't you don't convinced by the fact that these uh, unique clones were more mutated than the unique ones present at five months. Right? I'm not. I'm not convinced, and nor am I surprised. The longer you sit there, the more potential opportunities you have to generate to acquire a mutation. Okay. Sure. Fine. Well, so they they believe that the third dose is is expanding the memory B cell compartment because of these observations. And if I took the second dose person and I gave them an infection, they wouldn't be expanded in the same fashion. Um, and if I did this for flu or for any other or any other any other thing that elicits a B cell antibody response, I would not see that. If no, I gave uh, two antigen, if I gave them two exposures, that I would get one thing, and if I gave them a third, I would get another. Well, I think it would happen in all cases. Okay, so. 
I think um, not really clear this. I'm not really clear why this is rocket science. No, they're just trying to explain the effect of the third dose. That's all. Well, I don't think that they've complained. I don't think that they've explained the effectiveness okay. of the third dose. I think. I mean, I, I didn't believe in the third dose to begin with. I thought that there was problems with the rationale, but that was just me. I would like to see this done in people who got two doses six months apart. <laughs> Well, that would be good, but I'd also like to see it in if you gave two doses, harvested a month later, gave a third dose, harvested a month later, then you can make a comparison. But to wait for the response to contract and say, oh, we don't see such great diversity as when it's going on, the, when it's, we don't see such great diversity when the curve is going down as when it's going up. Well, that's the way it works. I mean, come on. Okay. All right, so I, I think you have a valid argument. So Amy differs from the conclusions of the authors. They think the third dose expands the memory B cell compartment. She feels the experimental design doesn't permit that conclusion. Okay. Yeah. So the next, they cloned and made 472 monoclonal antibodies. So for this, Amy, they need the paired heavy and light chains, right? Sometimes, not all the time. Just a variable with some yeah, other heavy? Yeah, you can put it into a, a vector that automatically expresses the IG1 domain. Okay. That's what we got dinged about. Remember, <laughs> we were going to make recombinant monoclonals, and the vector that we pulled out or whatever we said we were going to do was we were going to take advantage of IgG1 because it has more tools available to do experiments. And the reviewer said, oh, but the backbone really makes a difference. So then we had to come back and say, okay, we'll do it in all the different backbones. Story of our life. Yeah, it is. All right, 472 monoclonal antibodies, one from each clonally expanded family, and nine from individual memory B cells that were found only once in each participant. So rare, what they call singlets. 459 of these bound in an ELISA to the RBD so that they were happy that their B-cell isolation method works. 191 antibodies that they got after the third dose were compared with 34 antibodies isolated after the first dose. 79 and 168 uh, isolated 1.3 and 5 months after the second dose. Yes, and what is interesting is there was no statistical significant change in binding. That's right. So you went through all this, you told me about all this crappy somatic mutation, and at the end of the day? Well, binding and a neutralization is different. Okay? Yeah, Hang on. but, you know. Hang on. Binding is, is, is the same. You're right. You know, all these different antibodies from the first and second and third dose, yeah, they bind the same. But when you do... Neutralization assays. Okay, now we're doing neutralization with pseudotype. No, no change in antibody potency against uh, between 1.3 and five months after the second dose. That's very interesting. But the potency improves after the third dose. Okay. And the potency of antibodies isolated after the third dose which is nine months after the prime dose, was indistinguishable from antibodies isolated from convalescent vaccinated individuals 12 months after infection. So, oh. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So infection and, and vaccination is good as vaccination and boosting. Okay. Okay. I wonder, wonder. I wonder what it's I, well, like if you just have after infection. Well, the thing is, Amy, this is antibodies. You know, I really would like to see disease. Okay, so uh, the antibodies oh, alone. We don't do disease here. No, that's, no, this is all. This is all neutralization. Do disease, disease here. Because I think it's more than neutralization that factors into disease. So this is not the whole story, right? Really? There's this other entity. So then they have these persisting clones, right, that they see after the first doses and the third, they're called persisting. They're neutralizing <laughs> activity. Than the singlets. <laughs> they, their neutralization activity improves after the third dose, All right? So in other words, those antibodies are undergoing somatic hypermutation. They can track that in their isolation and sequencing, and the neutralization is better. Okay, so that's what I meant, Amy. They're... There, it's not binding is not the whole story. 
But I know I was being sarcastic. Oh, okay. I'm I'm aware binding's not the whole story. I do do this for a living. Now. I know you know that. I know. So basically, <laughs> there is an improvement in the neutralizing potency against SARS-CoV-2 a month after giving the third mRNA vaccine compared with 1.3 months after the second dose. Most of this improvement in neutralizing activity, which happens between five months after the second dose and one month after the third dose, is accounted by new unique antibodies and expanded uh, cells from clones that were existing before. See, I don't know how you could say it's unique if you have low frequency and then you contract it and you they stop doing whatever and now you're stimulating them Well, again. they're just saying unique because they didn't see them before, but they agree that they might have been at a low level. They do say that, yeah. Well, I, yeah, I'm, yeah. All right, I mean, so, all right, now next, what about neutralization breath? Again, if I'm at a low level, I'm I'm going to look like I I don't have as wide a range, right? Yeah, this is true, but that's you know physiologically important, right? Right, but you know, if I only have one cell that makes the most potent antibody, right? Yeah, and I have fifteen cells that make fifteen other antibodies at higher concentration that are less potent. Yeah. You know, it looks like it's inc it's increased the neutralization in the breath, right? But I really only needed very little of the potent of the super potent antibody, right? I didn't really care about the fifth. I don't really care about the fifteen others, yeah, right? Right. Unless they all work in synergy, and then you're not you can't. As we've been told on our last grant, you can't measure avidity. You can only measure affinity, right? That's right. Once again, our <laughs> our luck in grant applications, right? Well, I learned something, right? Of course. Yeah, hopefully you know? that's one good thing. You don't get your money, but you learn something, right? <laughs> I did learn something. Don't use the word avidity at a crap. Um, <laughs> but that you do have to admit that that's the way the antibody response works, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In biochemistry. So let's do some biochemistry now. They wanted to look at the um, epitopes involved in this neutralization breath. So when, when in most of the uh, anti- RBD antibodies that neutralize that you get from uh, people vaccinated after the second vaccine dose are belonging to what is called class one and two. They target a region that overlaps the ACE2 binding site on the spike. So they are more potent at neutralizing than class three or four antibodies because they interfere with class one and two interfere with ACE binding and class three or four are a little bit further away and don't directly interfere with uh, ACE2 binding. Okay, so class two so and one. So basically what you're telling me is that the immune dominant epitope, I get the antibody first too? <laughs> is that basically what you're telling yeah, me? Yeah, the immunodominant epitope <laughs> okay, overlaps. With, it's called class one and two and overlaps <laughs> yeah, with the ACE2 binding state. Whatever yes. you want. But that's the definition of the immune dominant. Yeah, right? well, you have to put it into <laughs> classes so that you can categorize them, okay? Sure. Now, the epitopes in class three and four are potentially uh, broader in their neutralization ability because those are more conserved. Yes, sequences. but they're weaker in their neutralization <laughs> they're ability. Weaker. So yes. let me get this straight. So when I want to combat <laughs> a novel vaccine, a novel entity, I want to make the weakest antibody first. Is that what you're telling me? Well, Unfortunately, that's what we're stuck with. Maybe we could improve it. No, with we're stuck with the fact that we made the immune dominant antibody first. Well, that's because we used the spike, I guess. I don't know. Well, what else could you do? That's the thing that I'm I guess. I'm just saying which, that if you think about this, I mean, if you really put it in simplest terms, I mean, even if you're in um, infection or vaccine, you mean to tell me that I'm going to make the antibody that is against the immune recessive, quote unquote, epitope first? That doesn't, well, it's the same with flu. The, the stem of the HA is immunosubdominant. Right. And they're, they're, they, we, they neutralize more weakly than right. the head. And right. the head is dominant, <laughs> but they change, right? And that's the problem. Right. But the thing is, is by the time I make so many immune subdominant, I'm dead. Yeah, I understand. 
Okay. So All right. Like, so they wanted to see what epitopes you, get you, you get after the third vaccine dose. So you know what they did, Amy? Biolayer interferometry. Shocking. <laughs> so the largest group of RBD binding antibodies after the second dose are class one, two, right? The immunodominant antibodies. <laughs> doesn't change 1.3 in five months after the second dose. In fact, uh, although the distribution, uh, the, the classes don't change, the relative representative of class one and two decrease. And this trend continued after the third dose with increased representation of antibodies in class one slash four and three resulting in a difference in the epitope distribution. So basically, between the second and third dose, you get a, a uh, different uh, antibodies emerging against these uh, different classes. Well, I've these, saturated the amount of combinations for that one area, right? That's so right. Now I'm going to go to the next area. And these I mean, differences were accounted for primarily by the emergence of unique clones and singlets after the third vaccine dose. So they're basically saying that. I don't believe uh, that you can say that it, they emer primarily emerged because you waited until the response contracted. All right. So uh, given, that, been, given that argument, let's just go with their argument. I understand your, your reservation, but let's say that's the case. Fine. So basically they're saying that the breadth increase of the, uh, the serum of vaccinated people given a boost is accounted for by the third dose, which gives you these, uh, these different targets that are uh, more broadly neutralizing. Yeah, but see, this is, but they're more, okay, so they have a bigger footprint, but they're weaker binders. They're weaker neutralizers. Well, they're weaker neutralizers, but they're broader. Yeah. They, broad, okay. they, they, they neutralize multiple variants of concern, right? Sure. So then they wanted to know, do the neutralizing antibodies in the clones that persist from five months to a month after the third dose, are those the ones that are developing increased breadth? They took 18 antibody pairs between the second and the, the five months after the second dose and one month after the third dose. And they measured neutralization uh, of, uh, of various viruses with those uh, panel of uh, SARS-CoV-2 pseudoviruses. Um, and so they find that... Uh, 11 out of 18 antibodies isolated a month after the third dose neutralized Omicron BA1, but not after five months after the second dose. Most pairs of antibodies obtained from clones persisting between five months after the second dose and a month after the third showed exceptionally broad neutralization and there was little change in antibody breath within the analyzed pairs. So... There, so, you, so the breath is, is already present after the second dose. It is, but it's amplified after the third dose, yeah. Shocking. So if I so if I got exposed after the second dose with after the five month period, I have the equivalent protection of the third dose after the first month. Yeah, but you need that amplification of the third dose too. But I, I no, actually, I don't because if I had taken the five, if I had gotten infected after mm. the five months, oh yeah, that would have done it. Yeah, that would have. Uh, yeah, and we're seeing that people. <laughs> okay. So then they compared antibodies in memory cells found uh, one point three months after the second dose to antibodies a month after the third vaccine dose. The proportion of Omicron neutralizing antibodies increased from 15% after the second dose to 50% among the antibodies found after the third dose. So that's what we're talking about. Even though those antibodies are there, they increase in the proportion uh, that can neutralize. In other words, the B cells, the number of B cells that can recognize Omicron have increased after the third dose. And I'm sure that they would have increased after the second dose if I had gotten infected. They would have, sure, but not not everybody wants to be infected. So memory B cell clones <laughs> emerging after the third dose have increased breadth and potency against variants that were not present in the original mRNA vaccine, which is against the ancestral virus. So they're, they're giving a lot of credit to that third dose at expansion of the memory B cell pool. Then they did a last experiment, Amy, with people who were infected. 
they have convalescent, unvaccinated individuals 12 months after infection. So they wanted to compare the breath, the neutralization breath of third dose vaccine antibodies nine months after the prime, right? So mm-hmm. the, the, with antibodies from this cohort. Mm-hmm. And this cohort, 12 months after infection, have an increase in neutralization breath. Other people have shown that before. The two groups of antibodies are equally and remarkably broad. 92 and 94% of the convalescent and third dose antibodies neutralize beta and Omicron. So they conclude that third dose vaccine elicited antibodies are at least as broad as those elicited by infection. Then this is just infected people, not vaccinated. However, um, I would like to know how they fare with respect to moderate, severe disease, hospitalization, and death, right? Well, you didn't see it, but the argument of Omicron being more mild, right? They argued that the Omicron was more mild, and that was based on the fact that you had already had an immune response, and so you just yeah, recalled course. it, right? Yeah. And we course. argued that the virus actually wasn't more mild. You were recalling your immune response, which was showing that you were protected after two doses. Yeah. By okay. the way... So exactly... What was uh, so? What have I? Uh, what have I been? Ar- so is this a point of time where we're going to say, well, four months ago when Amy said X, she was right? Well, yes, but we needed the data to substantiate your theory, right? That's the okay. way I look at it. Sure, we could go with that. All right. So let's let me just make a few points from the discussion that are really, if you like immunology, this is quite interesting. So, as I said before, memory B cells can developed from the germinal center in the lymph node or from what's called the germinal center independent B cell compartment. The B cells in the germinal centers undergo multiple rounds of division, maturation, and selection. So they have more mutations than those in the activated compartment. So they have fewer mutations. So if you have, you clone out an antibody gene with just a few mutations compared to one in the same patient six months ago, that was probably made in a non-germinal center or a germinal center independent B cell compartment. What they found in this paper, the third dose of mRNA vaccine expands ex- persisting clones of memory B cells. So the ones that are already there and some undetected clones that have mutations indicative of germinal center residence. So basically you expanded all the B cells, even the ones that you thought you had lost because they yes. were they were low copy number. Okay, so yes. you've just ex- so we can summarize this as the third vaccine, the third antigen exposure expands all persisting clones. It, it expands the persisting ones, but it also expands these undetected clones, previously so undetected. Which, it expands. It just expands B cells yes, because so, you we are don't at know. the level of your, the detection of your assay, which doesn't say that those clones are not present. Right. The They're only thing beneath the level of detection of here, your assay. Here's what I'm trying to say: these expand the expansion of these undetected clones. They have a lot of mutations in them, so they were made in germinal centers. They are different from the persistent ones because they target more conserved regions of the RBD. Very different epitopes as we were just going through in this analysis. So we didn't see those before. So they may because not have been we were, present. Because there was one cell and now we yeah, have okay. 15 cells. I can't argue against it because I'm not a B cell immunologist. Maybe they could argue against it, right? Well, I think like when we discussed this with Ben for 68, this was, that was his argument that there are some things that had five cells and then there were some things that had one cell. That's why they're called rare. So fi- let me just end with their final <laughs> The conclusion. final statement, or Listen, the second to last wait, wait, statement wait, not is that, the not funniest that. one. We'll get to that, not yet. So when you get the third vaccine dose, you boost your antibody levels, you boost your memory B cells to, to include neutralization of uh, variants, including Omicron. And, but they say the levels are insufficient to prevent infection in many individuals, which is correct. It doesn't prevent infection. They say the third dose also gives increased number of B cells that make more potent and broader antibodies. Here, Amy, listen to this. Our data does not exclude the possibility that Omicron-specific memory was present before and unaffected by the boost. 
However, others have demonstrated that the boost increases the frequency of Omicron RBD binding memory B cells. So they agree with you, basically. So you, they've spent how many pages now? A nature paper. It's an entire okay. nature paper. But I do like, uh, what did they say? Uh, so I forget where it is, but then I like the last. I like the last sentence about rapid recall of by memory T cells. Where was there a memory T cell? So in this, this is paper? very interesting. <laughs> so they make the argument that um, when when your so your memory cells don't make antibody, but when you see antigen, they begin to make it within three to five days. All right, and then they say if we give people antibodies within three to five days of infection we can prevent severe disease and death. So they're arguing. Then they say, <laughs> thus, rapid recall by memory T cells and a diversified and expanded memory B cell compartment are likely to be key mechanisms that contribute to the enhanced protection against severe disease by a third mRNA vaccine dose. So this is very I interesting. I don't understand this. this I don't understand this. So this is an interesting ever. little twist here because they're, all of a sudden T cells come in. They haven't been mentioned before in the paper. And they don't want to say it's just B cells because there have been a lot of studies done on T cells uh, so far. So they're saying, okay, we can make antibodies in three to five days. So you're going to get infected. You're going to have a mild disease. But that, together with T cells, probably prevents you from getting yes, sick. Yes, but the passive administration of antibodies within the same window prevents most serious complications. So, it's a, but the passive administration of antibodies yeah, when they're you know. doing antibody when we when Daniel and everybody was doing monoclonal antibody therapy, well, those yeah, people we, were majorly naive. Yeah, but there it doesn't matter. No, the there point is, is that of, the point no is if you give that. no, the point is if you give antibodies in this window, they're arguing that prevents severe disease, and that's correct. So they say that's a good argument that B cells are really important for preventing severe disease. But they also throw in T cells. It's funny because <laughs> they don't want to. I don't know the way it's written. The memory B cells expressing more important broader antibodies do not appear to contribute to circulating plasma antibody cells. But upon challenge yeah, with antigen yeah. in a form of a vaccine or infection, they produce a large amount of B cells within three to five antibodies, days. Antibodies. Antibodies. Antibodies within, within three to five days. Yeah. Passive administration of antibodies within the same window prevent prevents most serious like it's not well constructed. It's not a well constructed argument. Well, you know, they're making an analogy that if you can make antibodies a memory recall within three to five days, which is faster than the initial exposure, right? And and we know that giving antibodies to people in that window protects them against severe disease. It must be that the antibodies are playing an important role of in protection against severe disease. But I think it's funny that they throw in T cells as well. Yeah, it is <laughs> right? funny, but I just think that the whole I think that the whole anyway. last three statements of this paper are not argued properly. But well they're they're trying not. to argue that the antibodies Yeah it's not are flushed important. out. Okay. But anyway, it seems with with Amy's caveats, it looks like the third dose expands the memory B cell pool. How long it lasts is a good question. We we don't know, right? And how long the memory B cells were last, uh, we'll find out. Well, why would they why would they last longer now than they do before? What do you What do you mean? If they contract within five months of the second response, no, why they're always they going to be there. So my question is: Are there always going to be a pool of memory B cells? How many years? Five, ten, fifteen, twenty years, or are they going to go away in five years? Right, long lived B cells. Yeah, I don't think sure. I. I don't know why they would be. Why I don't think that just because you have memory B cells, don't you get a memory B cell response after SARS-CoV one and it dissipates within a year, right? Yeah, but the T cell memory lasts for seventeen years, right? Yeah, but we're not talking about the T cells, right? And you get a memory B cell response you know, to flu and stuff, but it only lasts a year, right? So, yes, that's right. Well, we don't know how long this is going to last. But if I it doesn't think, last long, I want to know if you come back in five to seven months after the third dose and you do this study again, if you're going to, and you give somebody a fourth one, if you're going to tell me that the breath expanded even more. I'm sure we're going to see that in nature, Amy. <laughs> 
Okay, good. All right, thank you. That was a lively discussion. Did you like, Dixon, I thought you would like to know what the boost did to you. He muted himself. <laughs> the boost so far has uh, allowed me to avoid severe infection, and I haven't died from SARS-CoV-2 yet. But uh, it's possible that what I'm experiencing right now is a uh, mild form of it, since Marlene has already got something like this, and uh, two days ago was sneezing and coughing and everything else. So oh. it's possible that watch this space. That's all I can tell you. I hope my B cells are doing the job. Yeah, they're recalling. <laughs> That's yeah, exactly right. That's um. They're, let's, rec they're let's, recalling. <laughs> Is that like when you stand on the mountain and you yodel? And you're yeah, right. called right. like that. Your yes. goats. Isn't Let's that what you do when you stand on the mountain and yodel? Your goats yeah, are supposed recalling. to come. Isn't that Heidi? React. It's proliferating. The B cells are <laughs> proliferating. All right. So let's do a couple of emails. Dixon, I think you should take that first one. Well, I guess so. Uh, Christine <laughs> writes uh, Hello, Twiv. Does Dr. Dupamier know that he was quoted in Le Mans today? That, that was not today, but that was some time ago. Yes, I guess so, since they interviewed him. <laughs> it's uh, behind a paywall, but I got the PDF of it, so they attached it. It's all in French, so get out your French dictionary in case you don't speak any French. And it's about vertical farming. Dixon de Pommier, the author of the book, The Vertical Farm, Professor Emeritus of Columbia University, in yep. conferences, is, conf <laughs> is profoundly convinced that... The uh, profoundly convinced <laughs> the, 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 what, the buildings with the the stories vertical are, yeah, are the vertical farms vertical farms yeah they convert they converted you to French they did well it's a French newspaper so what do you expect nice that's it's very fine. good it's fine Amy can you take the next one sure Ben writes. Hello, Twifsters from Switzerland, where it was a frosty four degrees Celsius for my morning bike ride, but a glorious 20 degrees on the way home in the afternoon. Oh, yes. It sounds good. It is this time of year again where you wear gloves in the morning and short sleeves in the afternoon. I love it. The only downside is the hay fever. I've been an avid listener for quite a few years now, listening to every episode of Twivo all the way back to the first one. After the pandemic struck, I started listening to Twiv and Twim as well and haven't stopped yet. I've become a regular Patreon donor because I could not, with good conscience, continue listening to so much good stuff without giving something back. I love what you're doing with the incubator. I'm just listening to Twiv 890 looking into a booster crystal ball. Wow, boosters, once again. You were talking about the public being misled by the term breakthrough infections. Once again, did we have that discussion today? Misled because you as experts know that it is quite common that you get mild reinfections with other viruses after vaccination. I was discussing this with my wife and we both as laypersons were not actually aware of that. At least from our perspective, it was not the term which raised wrong expectations, but lack of knowledge for long-term vaccine effects. So here are some questions to get us some education. What other common vaccines allow for reinfection? What symptoms do you typically have? Do we have any hard data on how common it is or a lack of data since infections are so mild that people wouldn't even go to the doctor or a lack of testing? Thanks for all you do. I'm looking forward to see Prof. Racaniello live at the public lecture in Zurich soon. Ben, bullet, bulletin on YouTube. Biolution. Biolution on YouTube. I didn't know my lecture was public. Cool. That's great. Um, but I, so I mean, how common, many, how many common, vaccines allow for infection? All vaccines allow for reinfection. We have never developed a sterilizing vaccine. So if you get what infected about rabies? with rabies. Uh no, it allows for infection. Just inhibits really? yeah. I'm I'm telling you this because I had on my first interview in January, we had this discussion and a woman there said we've never developed a sterilizing vaccine. 
you can prevent neuroinvasion, you can prevent various other things, but you still get infected. And Here's, she works for the agency, so I'm taking her word for it. Here's a, a statement from a review article. Uh, it says, the perception that vaccines provide sterilizing immunity where the disease agent does not establish an infection, while widely held, is generally unfounded and largely unrealistic. You have to love that. <laughs> Why, you? did I say something wrong? No. Exactly. It's confirming what you just said. Now, what symptoms would you have, Amy? Let's say you got infected with, you're, you're immunized with polio vaccine and you happen to encounter polio virus in Afghanistan. I don't know. Maybe you get a little, fe a little low grade fever of like 99. You probably don't even know. Yeah. You don't get, you don't, we're only protecting against the development of paralysis. So you get infected and I'm sure if I cultured your stool, you would have infectious polio. But yeah. polio is really a febrile disease, right? 99.9% .9 of people have mild, low-grade fevers. You don't even get yeah. diarrhea or anything. So the problem with the COVID vaccine is that we're testing everyone. So we see infections that we would normally see with polio and measles and flu. Old flu. But we don't test for them, so we don't see it. So that's why we have this perception of sterilizing right. right right so like when i talk to my family who are not P phds and not virologists and i say even the polio vaccine they're all flabbergasted because as far as they were concerned everybody who got po who was infected with polio developed paralysis um so i would like to see someday Everyone tested on a weekly basis for all the viruses against which we are immunized. Some kind of rapid test and just to show people how often you actually get infected with a variety. Maybe not so much. Hey, I bet even polio in the U.S., right, Amy? Today? Yes. For sure. How about but measles? We, we, yeah, we there's measles of, around too, right? For sure. Oh, yeah. Otherwise, you wouldn't get you wouldn't get outbreaks in the unvaccinated, right? And mumps, mumps, and rubella, yep. and hepatitis. That's hmm. right. Viral meningitis. Yeah. Um. I mean, we would have to leave off polio because we we have this idea that it's eradicated. Yeah. So we don't want to dispel any, you know. But wouldn't that be a useful assay to monitor everybody for various infections? But then it's, oh, it's too expensive. What are you going to get out of it? Well, I don't know why it would be so expensive if you just had one lateral flow that, like, you know, you went to your doctor or whatever. They gave it oh. away for free out of a vending machine. I want it to be a home test. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. But All somehow right. you have to get it, right? So, like, what do yeah. you what do you do? Like, at random, it's like spam mail, like junk mail. <laughs> yeah, you get a rap, you get a lateral flow in the in the mail. Most people are going to throw it away. I don't want this. <laughs> exactly, it's junk mail. Dixon, I'm going to have you read the next one because it's shorter than the last one. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, let's you know, see. Uh, that would be uh, right. yeah. Hi, Vincent and crew. The discussion at the end of the podcast about the Atlantic was interesting, and it picks up on a thread from earlier in the year when you were all enthusing about the Atlantic. I'm from Australia, and I read some articles from the Atlantic and have done so for a few years. It's not totally behind a paywall. There are five articles free per month or thereabouts. On foreign affairs, I think that Vincent will have no trouble understanding it. I have a few of their free articles via the newsletter links, and they are all very interesting, such as a recent ones on Ukraine. The speed of nerdy podcasts and your listener base, you guys got to mention on Seneca podcast, which is about China, and has lots of interviews with China watching at academics. <clears throat> Regards, Millie. We often visit the Atlantic. It's interesting. 
I like it. I think it's good. It is good. I don't think anybody ever said it wasn't good. Now you just question the the reach, right? the readership, the readership. Yeah. yeah, that's right. I mean, I've been meaning to subscribe. I should really pull the switch. Is that how you say it? Throw the switch. Yeah. Okay. Now, in um, I don't know. Keep, I procrastinate. You you like to read it though. I know you pick a lot of articles from the Atlantic, Amy. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I mean, I think that they're well written, and some of the articles in more common newspapers are not yeah. as well written. I agree. All right. Now, the last uh, email is kind of keeping with our first article from today. In, in environmental issues. So Maria, Maria writes, I've been catching up on the episodes today. I finished listening to Epitope 881. At the end, Rack and Yellow mentioned a notebook that uses calcium carbonate paper. Although it reduces the amount of trees, pulp used paper, it's not the most eco-friendly option. Currently, many paper producers use not only FSC paper, but also include, excuse me, up to 60% recycled paper to produce new of course, not all do so. Whenever we buy something that has paper, we have to research what type of paper it's made of. There is a real recycling industry of paper. That's why it's so important to segregate it correctly. And shed, shredded paper is not accepted. On the other hand, calcium carbonate paper uses plastic to keep the paper structure, making it a mixed material immediately. This makes it impossible to be recycled. And as far as I know, there isn't any recycling plant accepting it. Only some brands like Karst accept it, but you will find that they don't explain exactly what they do with it. It sounds a bit like what TerraCycle does for some brands. Could it be recycled? In theory, yes, but not in reality. Recycling is a business, and if the process is too complicated or expensive, and the process and the product is too little, and there's no buyer for it, no one will do it. As simple as that. You can read more about it in the following link. Paper made from calcium carbonate at Popular Mechanics. Uh, dot com. Speaking of shredded paper, I, I I did learn that our recyclers will not take it. So now I put it in my compost heap and it works very well there. What about the worms? The worms only want newspaper. You cannot give them glossy shredded paper. Oh, they're so finicky. Who knows? They're, they're worms. They're extremely finicky eaters, but they do like newspaper. I do not get a newspaper, but periodically someone throws one at the end of the driveway and the best thing I can do with the New York Times is to shred it and give it to the worms. <laughs> Continuing, it's been proven that plastics emit greenhouse gases. The study of Royer and collaborators shows that HDPE, plastic two, produces methane and ethylene when exposed to sunlight while incubated in water. Also, although this type of paper is sometimes suggested to be left to photodegrade, which we both know is not the same as biodegrade, it would keep contaminating the atmosphere and creating a nanoplastic issue in the soil where it's left. Finally, the petrochemical industry is responsible for a huge amount of carbon emissions in the U.S. Uh, she provides a link for that. And HDPE, as all plastics come from fossil fuels. I understand that this is a complicated issue. I would never suggest using virgin resources for disposable things. So I would suggest getting notebooks, books, print, or write on paper in a less impactful way. First, avoid it, then reuse already existing things, secondhand books, print, or write on the back of printed paper. I used to erase my calculus practice notebook for every semester in college, and I have old used but empty planners rewriting the number of the day on it. And finally, use new stuff made from recycled materials. I'm not an environmental engineer, just a biologist, but I like to research on this topic. So sure, there are things I might not be taking into account, but I hope that my analysis will help others question the description we are given by the companies regarding environmentally friendly products. Best regards, Maria. Well, I feel badly about buying my Karst notebook, but it's only one. I'm not going to throw it away. And it's really cool. Do you know what the word karst means? It's, it's like the calcium carbonate, right? The exactly. Cliffs. It's a geological term for calcium carbonate. And they, so, so this the caves of karst caves. The bats live in those, right, Dixon? They do. And the white cliffs of Dover are made of calcium carbonate, right? Solid, absolutely solid. Which came from 
those uh, those organisms with the calcium carbonate diatoms, diatoms, diatoms and uh, Emiliana huxleyi. Yes, that's correct. E hux, very E-hux. cool stuff. Did you yep. like that email, Dixon? I thought you would like that. Of course, I liked it. Of course. Do you? Do, so I, I try not to use very much paper, frankly. No. And no, what I, paper? I you know, the thing that gets me is we get all this junk mail. I don't want it, and it's such a waste of paper. You learn this when you clean out your lab for the last time. <laughs> I got. I'm starting to get junk mail even here at the incubator. Sure, of course, of course. All right, it's time for some picks. Yep. Dixon, what do you have for us today? Uh, a wonderful gentleman from Belgium. He has been around a long, long time. In fact, he's not around anymore. He died, but he's being celebrated. <clears throat> His name is Toots Steelman. And he is the most fantastic harmonica player you ever want to hear. Wonderful music, but better than that, his personality is so charming. My wife and I went to see him at the uh, Rose Theater at Lincoln Center for jazz. And he was so touching in his thanks to the audience. It was a, obviously a tribute to his music. <clears throat> that at one point, the entire audience stood up and everybody's hands were on their eyes, wiping the tears away. Because he was such a wonderful gentleman and was very humble and extremely talented. So this is a, a good recognition to somebody who's spent his whole life making other people happy. Hmm. Are you going to do a, a series of 10 jazz musicians now? Would you like me to? I would love to. Well, let's do that. That's great. I'll, I'll be glad to. Yeah. I'm, I, I look back with fondness on your 10 comedians. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah, wasn't sure. Billy Crystal one of them? Um, Billy Crystal, no. Because oh, I know, like, he has a new Broadway show for like Mr. Yeah, Saturday he's on Night. Broadway right now. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> no, well, I, Caesar was at the top of my list. You know Jazz Dixon, so let's do that. Okay. I, I would love to. Okay. Amy, what do you have for us? So I have an article that describes the largest comet and its diameter, and it's like circulating around uh, Neptune now. And it was, the Hubble just took pictures of it. I thought it was kind of cool, because, you know, it's the largest comet ever. And it's pretty, yeah. Your, your link is not working, so I'm trying to. All right, well. The largest that, comet that identified. Is. Let's see, I'm trying to search. It's IOP science, right? I think so. Here we go. Hubble's telescope finds the largest comet ever discovered. It's bigger than Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. Rhode Island is... A movie on Netflix right now called Don't Look Up. It's with Leonardo DiCaprio. Yeah. And and, and it's all about the world's largest comet that's going to come and kill the Earth. No spoiler alert. Yeah. Sorry, no (laughs) spoiler That's it. Dixon reached the end of his rope. I see. No spoiler alert, but you won't enjoy the movie. It's poorly done. Oh, it oh is? that's okay because I have the poorly, attention. Poorly sp- I have the attention span of a two-year-old, so I sit there for about ten minutes, and then it's like background no, noise. It deserves less than that, unfortunately. Right. I'm sorry to hear that. Um, but I just thought it was kind of cool to have the largest comet. I mean, I spent this week actually my. Father and I spent this week watching somebody make challah because I saw this. He made a challah into the shape of the brain. Remember that, Vincent? (laughs) Yes, I do. And I thought that that was really cool. (laughs) But his wife decided that that was ick. She said it was too gross and only a scientist would appreciate that. Did you like it? I thought it was really cool. And the guy downstairs, who's the departmental administrator, saw me watching it while I was walking down the hall to the restroom. And he asked me, and I told him, and he thought it was really cool. But when she said, Ech, I was like, okay, can't pick that. <laughs> Gotta no. move on. I like it. I think, you should pick it. <laughs> I think you should pick it next time, okay? <laughs> I like it. It was kind of cool, yeah. All right, my pick is an article in Science Based Medicine, which is a very nice blog which is called Scientific Review Articles as Anti-Vaccine Disinformation. So it's about the idea that anti-vaxxers often use, they write dubious review articles to make their point. 
which is mainly wild speculation. They usually end up in crummy journals. He calls them, this is written by David Gorsky, bottom feeding journals. Is that like the National Enquirer? No, that's not a journal at all. <laughs> but more recently, a review was such a review was published by an El Sevier journal, which, you know, usually they don't, they don't have bottom feeders, but they shouldn't have published this article. It's an article by Peter McCulloch, which he claims establishes a framework for mRNA vaccine harm. And, you know, he, he goes through this article and says it's all speculation and most of it's wrong. But the fact that it's published in an El Sevier journal gives it weight. And many people think that it's a problem. With, you know, vaccines are a problem. So he goes through this article and, and who wrote it and what's wrong with it. And just generally uh, why this is a problem and how, what can we do about it? It's, it's just sad that, you know, the, the best of science can be taken and turned around to use as anti-science. It should Isn't there a you. famous saying about the best of intentions? Uh, yeah, I think there is. How does that go? The best? I don't uh, know. I just know that no, I thought the road that to hell is paved with the best intentions, intentions or something. Yes, that's right. The road to hell is paved with the best intentions. Okay, that's right. Something like that. What you learn is that. Yes, everything can be twisted and used. No question. In a way that was not intended to be. And certain, some people, many people have no qualms about doing that. I just don't understand it. It's very sad. But anyway, this is a very illuminating uh, article. Please read it. And that is the end of TWIV 896. You can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash TWIV. You can send us questions, comments, pics of the week. Twiv at microbe.tv. You can uh, support us if you really like what we do. If you like our science chat, which some have likened to car talk for viruses here on Twiv. That's right. You think that's correct, Dixon? It certainly started out that way. And um, it, it really <laughs> hasn't stopped. So I think the answer is yes. So does that mean I need to get a car? Um, maybe if you're moving to Washington, D.C., you do. <laughs> well, maybe. <laughs> I'm sorry <laughs> to knows? hear that. I'm sorry to hear that you need to get a car, Amy. It's such a simpler life without one. <laughs> May not need to, but you might want one. I haven't said anything. Just I just was actually referring to whether or not I could listen to this or not if I didn't have a car. That's all I was Is referring it? to. Oh, well. I didn't yeah, refer to car. anything else. Depends how long your commute is. If it's ten minutes, then you're not going to get very. You're not going to get past the weather. Well, That's isn't true. that what somebody once told you was that they had to sit in their car because they like couldn't get past some part of it otherwise? Well, someone said that they like sitting and they keep driving around listening because they like it. Yeah. So my right. other option is to get a pet, right? Doesn't some doesn't Rich refer to this as dog walk? Get out your dog walking gear. Yeah, if you get a dog and you walk it listening to Twiv, you end up walking the dog for two hours every week. Yeah, so I either so you either need a car or a, or a pet, right? Anyway, if you uh, <laughs> enjoy our show, please support us. We depend on your contributions. We don't charge for anything. We don't put ads on anything. Uh, microbe.tv slash contribute. We are a 501c3, so your contributions are federal U.S. tax deductible. Dixon de Pommier can be found at trichinella.org and thelivingriver.org. Thank you, Dixon. I hope you feel better. I do, too. Thank you. I think I will. Amy Rosenfeld is... Sorry, go ahead. No, just had a good time, that's all. Well, I don't know. That's all. A good time is a good thing. Oh, no, a good time <laughs> for me. That's learning. You know. Amy Rosenfeld... Is uh, right, currently she's at Columbia University, but we'll see where she goes next. And she's also at antrovirus.net. Thank you, Amy. Thank you. You should write more at antrovirus.net. Yeah, I know. We need to, I need to update it. We should put on the paper and various other topics. Yeah, let's do that. And we should put, like, you know, watching for the intro season. You know, is there yep. going to be one? Let's predict. All right.
I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>